have John Thackerow with us here at the School of Design at Carnegie Mellon this week. And we just want to have a short conversation with you, John, and hear what you've been up to in the big wide world and what you've seen that's of interest. Ah, thank you, Terry. Well, my job is traveling around looking for interesting stories. And um, every now and again, I put those stories into a book. Yes. And sometimes I put them into a conference. And sometimes I put them into a festival. So it's now two years since my last uh, book was finished writing it, How to Thrive in the Next Economy. And I'm just more or less gearing up to deciding whether I should write another book or actually do something else uh, by way of the latest catch of stories that I've collected. Oh, interesting. What might another venue be if it's not a book? Well, I have written 12 books and they are very painful experiences, <laughs> as you know. And I just every time say never again. Yes. So I probably just need to wait another year and I'll do another book. Yeah. Because books have an incredible um, power to, yeah, to last in the culture. So people remember them even if they haven't actually read them, which I'm quite candidly aware of. Um, but it also, in my case, uh, my job is to say, well, there's lots of interesting projects happening in the world. What connects them and in other ways in which we can frame them in such a way that the, the total is greater than the sum of the parts. Yes. So that's kind of an, what, what books do, is to, is to frame otherwise random events. Yeah. Well, your, your latest book is actually text for our uh, Transition Design Masters and Doctoral Seminar, and it's helpful for that very reason. You know, the students are able to jump in in the middle and see what they need, and that's one of the things I appreciate, is that you don't have to use it in a chronological way if you don't, if you don't want to. Uh, and I, I didn't write it in a chronological way, and the reason I'm happy to be here is that the Masters and the, the PhD in transition design are unique in the world, really, as places where what otherwise would be a very diverse uh, combination of narratives and subjects come together. Yes. And one of the biggest challenges we all face in this question called transition to something better is that mm -hmm. everybody is stuck in particular ways of thinking and institutionally constrained, never mind in their minds. Yeah. And that anybody who, in your case, has been able to make a master's program where people bring together ecology, economy, culture, place, mm -hmm. science in an integrated but very open way. It's special that. That's why I'm happy to be here. Oh, thank you so much. Well, tomorrow you'll be joining the class, so we're really anxious, anxious for that. It's amazing to me how uh, quickly changing the students are in their acceptance of this notion of transition as a framework for their work. I mean, in the past, there was a very strong wish to have a subject where you could go and get a job, and that's still a big pressure on students. It's a big investment. I understand that. But, um, for example, the words transition and transition as a kind of accepted descriptor of mm -hmm. high-level work is becoming more well-known. Yeah. So, for example, the, the, the German government has ecological transition as part of its kind of main policy framework. Yeah. Uh, Angela Merkel talks about ecological transition in everyday speeches. Yeah. Emmanuel Macron, the possible new president of France, has it at the top of his agenda. Really? ecological transition above jobs, above you know, welfare, and above yes. these abstract notions of economy. So it's one of those ideas that is becoming a mainstream as a word, but there's not that many people who know what, what it means or how to do it. They understand or they intuit uh, where it's going, but they're not uh, having degrees in it yet. So you're really at the front of the pack in oh, that sense. Thank you. I mean, one of the things we think is really important now is to figure this out through a global network. Because I think most solutions uh, need to be place-based. So how can we share knowledge and information and then filter it through the place that we're in? And I think that that's one thing you've been doing, which is really interesting in traveling the world and then bringing the message to these various places. It's one of the dilemmas, but also one of the most fascinating design challenges is, I think, if you and I and many people agree that the more place-based an activity or a project or a community is, uh, unique to itself, then the less relevant global models are. Yes. So this world, you know, the word scalable solutions or scalable impact doesn't really make sense if you're being true to the notion that places are yes. unique. But that's not the same thing as saying that places can't share information, knowledge, skills, and even energy with each other, you know, yes. social energy. Yes. So I think that in the design world, we have a lot of interesting work to do of figuring out how multiple places can help each other yes. without being the same as each other. Yeah, so it's absolutely. a different model. Absolutely. So I'm interested in what you have been seeing, any trends you've been seeing since the last book. What's changing out there? What is of a special interest to you? 
What is a particular trend that is interesting is this notion of people in cities uh, looking more actively and more earnestly for ways to reconnect with rural life, with nature, with farming, with other places than their normal urban or mobility kind of centre, yeah. um, which is, I think, accelerating a lot because people are realising that it's not really realistic to abandon the city and become a peasant in a muddy field, yeah. even if that might be a romantic idea for a bit. Yeah. Um, and yet, on the other hand, it's not a clear yet what models of engagement a city person could have who wants to be associated with a farm or a forest or a river or a watershed. Yes. So my travels have taken me and I'm discovering lots of very interesting examples of where people partly taking very old models, like people helping with harvests goes mm -hmm. back for many generations, yes. Yes. but then reimagining that in the area of you know, mobile phones and yes. time sharing and barter and all these yes. new models. So, I think that it's just beginning, mm -hmm. but that's where you begin to feed back into the city the awareness of the realities of you know, farming, the land, the soils, mm -hmm. the biodiversity, which is one of the pathologies of cities is they don't think yeah. about that at all. Yeah. But it's also why I think people get stressed and, and, and scared and frightened yeah. in the city. Yeah. They don't have any connection with natural systems on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. So I think that there's just very practical ways which you design as a good at of reconnecting city and land in, in new ways. Yes, yes. And have you run across any examples of either design educators or designers who you feel are working in new ways that you'd like to tell everybody about? I mean, I'm always... Well, I'm stunned in the world of design education by the new forms and models that appear to be uh, emerging very quickly, just the last mm -hmm. kind of uh, year or so. Yeah. The notion of um, a master's, for example, where you spend some time online and then you go to a place for a unique experience. Mm -hmm. So my friends in Italy, um, Stefano Mietti has a program called Relational Design. It's a master's program all about how you can then change the connections between places and people and resources and yes. information. And the way that they carry out their work is by studying um, global issues to do with information or ecology or whatever. Mm -hmm. Then they go to a place and they study that place deeply. Yeah. And that's one of these experiments which represents this kind of answer of how you have the uniqueness of place and the globalization of activity yeah. and sharing at the same time. Well, and it sounds like it also uh, transcends this problem of people only studying online and there's no face-to-face -face contact anymore, which is always a worry I have. I think nothing replaces... All knowledge is uh, dialogic. One of my leader gurus, uh, you know, Martin Buber, said that in the 1930s. Yeah. And I think that we've been, and probably coming to the end of a period in which we imagined that all reality would be digital or could be represented digitally. Yeah. It was a kind of moment of uh, excitement for a generation or less. But on the other hand, people don't have the capacity or maybe even the will to travel perpetually anymore. So online will necessarily be part of our learning. I think the bigger change is whether we can escape from this straitjacket that one does a degree or a master's or a PhD within a fixed period of time during your youth, yes. which is a very deeply embedded model. How can one break that up in time yeah. so that you kind of do it on a kind of perpetual basis? And that's where the new models, I mean, people have said this many times over the years, but I think mm -hmm. these hybrid models where you kind of do online, offline, go to a place, meet as a cohort, that I think is creating the possibility for spreading it out over a longer period and not yes. feeling you have to do it all before you're 35. No, I quite agree. I, I went back to school when I was 27, 37, and 47. Right. So I, I obviously have another stint coming up real soon. I, I, yes. But I think that might be the key because people get to this midlife point and they don't know where to go or what to do. And one of the things we're trying here is a DDES program for mid-career professionals who can do a doctorate remotely, but they have to come here twice a year. Right. Now, I think that's a step in that direction, but this online component where you're actually traveling to different places sounds really interesting. I think that they're different places, but maybe not an infinite variety of places. So what I was saying about reconnecting cities and you know, biodiversity and natural systems in general, I can imagine that we have some kind of grand tour model whereby in your early years, you know, when you're a teenager or yeah. first time in university, you go to three or four places and study and learn about the yes. place, but maybe you go back to them as, as the years go by, yeah. Yeah. rather than frantically going to everywhere being new all the time, yeah. build up skill. 
This is certainly what the places need, by the way. So farmers, and I, I meet quite a lot of people trying to work with volunteers like woofers and those sorts yes. of people. Yeah. They're very desperate to have people who return on a regular basis, mm -hmm. learn about the land, learn about the, the culture, learn about the, the environment, so that they, the people who come on a part-time basis become more valuable as the years go by. Yes. Yes. And I actually think that we're more fulfilling for the, you know, for the student as well as a, a, a fair exchange of value with the farmer. Yes. I think that's really interesting. I uh, was at a conference in Brighton last summer, and we were doing a panel on the future of design education, and I proposed a model of a cosmopolitan localist university. And I wondered if universities could be of two flavors. You have the traditional ones like this, but maybe there's another kind of university where people that are more practically inclined or in interested in the land or craft go to those places, but then there's some sort of symbiotic relationship between the two because I quite agree that even though I myself am embedded in this very traditional institution, it has its limits. I think it's, it's everything is about avoiding binaries. So big, mm -hmm. you know, main Ivy League uh, institutions with their rigor and their traditions and their very slowly changing culture should be part of the picture because there are moments when we need to reflect, think deeply and so on, but they absolutely should only be part of the picture. But it's one of these many subjects which are, have been thought about in the past. So I'm very inspired at the moment by the folk high school system in the Nordic countries, oh, no, which were invented in the 19th century, um, more or less at the opposite time when they needed to find ways for country people to mm. adapt to and learn the skills of modernity and industrialization. Yeah so that these uh, regional institutions would help people adapt to what was happening mainly in the cities but also in the economy as a whole without having to leave the countryside. Okay. I think those kind of things can be not so much turned upside down but repurposed yes. to find new ways to connect people in different contexts with yes. each other through time. Um, a hybrid model in which one gains skills and expertise and yes. certificates, fine, that's the model yeah. now, but also where you have a relationship through time and trust and mm -hmm. mutual appreciation, yeah. which you can only get through re repeated kind of engagement. Yeah. And I think that models like that can be as, as interesting as the, as the prevailing model now. I quite agree. And in fact, this idea of time and pace, I think are, are really key. You know, at a place like this, the students are pressured to fill all their time and go as fast as they can, and really we all are. So models that start to look at how do you build relationships over longer periods of time and how can you go a little bit slower and maybe be a little more attentive to the quality of life in the present is. I think that the, the future is about having opportunities for people to engage at different speeds and tempos. Yes. And I don't think this is a hard sell because the notion that we all have to do everything at breakneck speed is just clearly counterintuitive, never mind being exhausting, even if you're a young person. Yes. But the, the proposition that there will have moments of intensity and speed interspersed with spending quality time in a place, like a, like a farm or a forest or a river, it takes months to find out how it works. Yes. I'm pretty confident that people will appreciate that. Yeah. So the institutions have to figure out if they want to sell degrees about that, but otherwise people will fashion their lives. And in my own work, a lot of what I do is to provide opportunities for people to engage in these situations mm -hmm. on the edge of their normal work or yes. um, educational activities. Yeah. And the pleasure and the fulfillment and the energy that they create is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So it's not a hard story it's just that the institutions are constrained by their legacy systems and the yes. students and people are having to deal with the costs and the kind of time pressures of what we have at the moment. Well I was just going to say that one of the root problems is the economic paradigm that we're all embedded within. You know there's never enough money or there's an imperative to grow and therefore the overhead increases and therefore the profit must increase so I could see, I mean, I know a lot of people who employ the kind of people that I associate with as students. The employers, never mind the startups or never mind the big organizations that already exist, mm -hmm. they are less and less persuaded by certificates and people having shelled out lots of money because, there's, frankly, there's so many people come along with a similar certificate, yes. which is shocking to think about. Yeah. That is a kind of starting point for mm -hmm. some of the more mainstream c companies. Mm -hmm. And they want to know, they see evidence of somebody who's been out of their comfort zone somebody who's actually demonstrated empathy in reality rather than just yeah. talking about it. Yeah. 
And so, and that's something where this is not an expensive addition, it's just a different part of one's life. So it should be a combination of the two. Yes, it comes back to balance in the end. Yes. Well, John, before we wrap it up, I'm just interested to know what's next on your horizon. What are you working on you'd like people to know about? The main thing I'm doing is continuing in the, during this year with workshops under the general umbrella heading of Back to the Land 2.0. Uh, these are workshops of between one and two weeks. I'm doing them in Sweden, England, uh, probably in India in the end of the year, where we literally bring t people together to say what are the ways available or that we can design or that we can curate yes. for engagement between city people and the uh, rural systems, farms and so on, yes. on which we all depend. So it's exciting stuff, and we're designing these connections as well as discovering them. Oh, great. And how can people find out more about that? They can look on thakura.com, my website, and they'll find most of it out there. Very good. John, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Terry.